I'm Dr. Michael Detola. And I'm Megan Strong. In this week's Case of the Week, we're going to see what happens when a dentist sends us an old bridge. And then in viewer mail, we've got a letter coming from Vermont, home of Ben & Jerry's, and the newest flavor, molar marshmallow with tartar and chocolate carries throughout. Mmm, delicious. And uh, you might be having a hard day at the office, but you're going to feel a little better about it when you hear what this oral surgeon went through. That and more on today's Chairside Live. Hey now, hello and welcome to episode 149 of Chairside Live. We've got a great episode for you today. Megan, you've realized it's summer. I have, and so I'm celebrating. And here in uh, Southern California, it seems to be that the end of August and September are really our hottest months. Yep. While the rest of the country is cooling down, we're heating on up. And the weatherman said that there's a heat wave coming. So. Oh, uh, I thought this was one. I know. And it's humid. I know. It's, it's so gross. Bad. It's gross. But, and I thought today that I'd actually turn out purple on camera because I had an overload of huckleberry because oh, Dr. Yeah. Aaron Elliott sent us an incredible huckleberry uh, package right. and huckleberry syrup and candies and, and honey and one of the, and one of the side effects is purple skin. Yes, but it, so thank you again so much, Dr. Elliott. It, w everything was so good. It was. It was fantastic. Thank you for that. Uh, we got an interesting case of the week for you today. We're going to take a look at what happens when we switch from a PFM bridge to an all ceramic bridge and the aesthetic challenge that presents. On today's case of the week, um, we're going to look at um, kind of an interesting situation here. First of all, props to the dentist. Uh, we've got a three unit bridge and on the heels of me spending s several weeks complaining about not taking um, full arch impressions for something like this, we have a uh, double arch, full arch tray. And there's definitely dentists who aren't too big on doing um, impressions this way. They'd prefer or they, they, they'd say it's better to do uh, a full upper impression, full lower impression with a bite registration. And uh, I don't know, I would probably agree with that. It'd be hard to kind of argue against it, unless the bite's correct on this, and then we're all good. Um, I don't see like light, a lot of light showing through there. Just, there's a little on the second molars right there and some on the first, so maybe that, that could be the patient's bite. But to me, the bigger point is we get very excited when we see a full arch impression like this for a three unit bridge, especially if it's in the posterior or if it's a four unit bridge and we have no posterior occlusion on that side with the preps. But that's what we get much more excited about is the fact that it's a full arch impression and not so much the bite. With so many unprepped teeth, it's gonna be relatively easy for us to uh, hand articulate this and get it right, even if the bite on this tray is incorrect. So if a dentist doesn't wanna do full upper, full lower and a bite registration, we're very happy to receive an impression like this because we feel highly confident that we're going to be able to hand articulate these models based on the wear facets and get it right into place. So the doctor did some nice preps and uh, a very nice impression. We're happy with that. He also sent this along and this is really what I wanted to talk about today, which is that uh, he sent along the old PFM for us to match the shape. Now I've, I used to do this and I would um, often just send little pieces. You know, you can see all the porcelain shattered off here and here, the two areas where the doctor cut it. I think he cut it on the lingual uh, in an attempt to save the, the facial porcelain um, here, but of course it came off and left opaque and, and the metal underneath. Uh, but there was a ponic in the middle, and so that got sent in. I would often, doctors will often, and I used to do this too, just send shards of some of the porcelain that came off, which makes it really difficult to use. And so, if we were replacing this with a PFM, this would be a good form of, of communication, but since the doctor wants to switch to an anterior brux or bridge, it makes it difficult because of the metal substructure that is on this bridge and how it influences the shade. And so when the doctor says match this, our technicians will usually try uh, to match it but we're, they're thinking a little differently. They're thinking, what would this porcelain look like if there wasn't metal behind it and opaque behind it? Both of those kind of throw it off. And so this is what they came up with, and it got sent to the doctor who tried it in the mouth and said it was too light. The value was too high. And they'll usually leave these a little higher in value or a little lighter than this one to make up for the fact that 
the metal we know is causing the value to go down because of the gray behind that. And the opaque helps battle that, but, but still there can be a gray hue to it, so they try to go a little bit lighter. And so this ends up being too high of a value uh, compared to the PFM bridge that was in place. And now the doctor sent some uh, photos or emailed it, or said he emailed it yesterday. We haven't received them yet. I checked on my way in. So we'll get to see what this looks like um, in the mouth, but we called the doctor back and also asked for a picture of a Vita Shade tab next to the teeth that he's trying to match. I don't think the stump shade necessarily had anything to do with it. Obviously, the stumps would play no role in the PFM bridge. But in an anterior Bruxer bridge, this material is translucent enough where dark stumps uh, could influence the final shade, much like it would on an Emax anterior bridge like this, for example. Uh, but considering the doctor said that the value is too high and this was too light and not too dark, I don't think the stumps are playing any role. But certainly, having a Vita shade tab next to the teeth we're trying to match is our preferred way uh, to be able to match those teeth. In fact, it's, it's preferable to us than even receiving this that matches well in the patient's mouth. And it's mainly because we're going from a PFM to an all ceramic restoration. If this were gonna be a PFM restoration, then we're thrilled to have this. Then this is actually better than the Vita shade tab in place uh, with a picture taken. But when we're switching from a PFM to an all ceramic, it's difficult for us to try to mimic what we see here because of the influence of the metal and the opaque underneath it, neither of which are gonna be on this all ceramic bridge. So I, I know exactly what the doctor was thinking. We would have all sent that in, it makes perfect sense. But when it came back light, um, the technician brought it to me and said, it's, it's really hard for us, and this was the managing technician, it's really hard for us to kind of go from PFM to all ceramic, and I really hadn't given that much uh, thought before. And so I guess the moral of the story is, um, it doesn't hurt to send something like this in, but if we're doing an anterior three a bridge like this and we wanna make sure that it matches, the best chance we have for getting it right for you and the patient is with a Vita 3D Master Shade Tab it lined up in size a ledge and size a ledge uh, next to the tooth that we're trying to match. In this case, it might be the two adjacent teeth uh, over on either side since both of these are prepared. But with that Vita shade tab in place and a digital photograph that's emailed to us, we can see exactly what uh, the shade of those teeth is and compared to say a 2M2 shade guide or maybe an A2 if you're using Vita Classic. And that really is a better way for us to dial it in because those Vita shade tabs don't have any metal substructure, don't have any opaque underneath them. And for us, it makes it easier to match it to an all ceramic restoration rather than using a PFM as we have here. Thank you for that, Dr. You're D. welcome. Now let's go to a segment we call Viewer Mail. For this week's viewer mail, we actually have two different letters from two different doctors. Our first one comes from Dr. Sonia Yao in Vermont, home to Ben & Jerry's, my favorite treat ever. Um, and she writes, what? Where's the shiny bald head that I look forward to every week? Seriously though, in one of the Accidental Genius podcasts, Dr. Detola mentioned that in the May edition of CR, the self-etching resin cements are getting poor results. I am very alarmed by this, as 3M Reliax Ultimate is what I rely on for all my crown cementation. See what she did there? Please advise. Keep up the good work, guys. Well, thank you, Sonia. And um, do not look into what it would cost to ship Megan some Ben & Jerry's on dry ice. I know it's going to be super uh, expensive, and don't, that is not required. No. There, there are certain things that are tougher to ship, and that's right, one and, but. Ben and Jerry's, you can see the whole point of this. I get it. You're right. Good point. All right. Well said. Oh, wow. That was so <laughs> right. rude. Well, we finish each other's sentences. I know what okay. you're going to say. It's to get local specialties that aren't available here in Ben and Jerry's. There is one in Fullerton and other places and available in your grocery store. Well, Sonia, uh, you bring up an interesting point, and I didn't quite say they were performing poorly. I'm going to have producer James put a graph up right now so you can take a look at it. And by the way, for anybody watching who's not a subscriber uh, to the CR newsletter, uh, what are you doing? Go to Clinician's Report. Uh, dot org and sign up. I get the paper one and I have a access to the online digital library so I can go back in time and look at something like the May one if I need to, which I find more convenient than, um, than actually saving the paper one. So if you look at the chart uh, that James has up there now, you can see all the different self-adhesive resin cements. Keep in mind, these are cements that have the uh, self-etch chemistry built into them. And if you look at the far column, or the second column from the right, it says bonded dentin self-adhesive. 
And a solid, kind of like Consumer Reports, a solid green circle is the best. A half circle filled is the second best. A third circle filled is the fair. And then empty or open uh, is poor, little, or none. And so you can see the bond to Denton in the self-adhesive mode. There's not that many that do that well. And if you look at the self-etch, that was a control, multi-link automics down there, you can see how it's two-thirds of the way filled, so it's getting a good. And the difference between multi-link auto mix and these self-adhesive cements is that the self-etch chemistry is separate where you have to mix the A and B primer together and then apply that to the tooth. So that's only about uh, an extra 20 seconds of work maybe to get about a 20 to 25 percent increase in bond strength. If you look at that very last column on the right, it says bond to dentin with adhesive. And that's the thing that these manufacturers never talk about, is that if you use these with adhesive, so in your case, you, you said Reliax Ultimate, but I think you meant Reliax Unisem, but you would use it with the ultimate bonding agent to increase that bond. I just don't know many dentists that are doing that. And that was really the point of what we saw at CR, was that uh, if you test it by itself with just the self-adhesive cement, you can see the bond to dentin is not very impressive. If you use the adhesive, you can see how it jumps up. So what we found regarding the bond to dent, and I'll just read right from it so I don't get the wording wrong. In vitro testing will, with accelerated stressing through thermocycling showed that self-adhesive resin cements had lower bond strengths than self-etch or total etch resin cements. And if you add an adhesive in, obviously um, it's going to get better. And some of the manufacturers will talk about this in their directions, uh, but many don't and the reps don't talk about it. And so most dentists that I know are just using Maxim Elite or Reliax Unison by itself without any adhesive, and that's where we see those weak bonds. So go to cliniciansreport.org and sign up for a subscription because there's all kinds of great research like that uh, coming out, and it's, it really you know, kind of helps you see that even though something appears to be more convenient than other cements out there, you might be paying a price for it, and that's one of the things we like to look at at CR. Okay, well then our second uh, viewer mail comes from Dr. Michael Spiegel and he writes, Dear Dr. Detola, I read that Duralon can be used as a temporary cement for provisional crowns on very short preps. How can I make sure that I can successfully remove the temp without destroying it? Can I dilute the Duralon with two drops of liquid? Would that help? Thank you. Well, that's a good question. In fact, I love using Duralon um, as a temporary cement, and I use it in exactly the situation you mentioned for a short clinical crown, but I also use it a lot when I have multiple units. So if I'm doing, let's say, a 12-unit biotemp bridge that might have five abutments and let's say six or seven ponics on it, a big long span bridge like that that I want to stay on, if it's specially, if it's over a holiday, I am going to use Duralon. Um, but I don't mess with the combination of the powder and the liquid at all because I find that it's very easy to get the temporaries off without damaging them because the Duralon doesn't stick to temporary materials much at all. I wish it did because what it does stick to is the dentin. And that's really the crux of using Duralon as a temporary cement is that it can be awfully shocking when you take the temporary off and go, oh, it came right off. Oh, it's clean on the inside. And then you see all the Duralon left on the prep. And then you might get an explorer to try to get it off. It's not coming off with an explorer. You might get a sickle scaler and try to get it off and it's gonna come off very slowly and it would take the better part of an hour to get it off. And so if I'm going to use Duralon as a temporary cement, I need to make sure, and I would suggest you do the same. I, in fact, I carry it with me everywhere I go. Oh, wow. It's the Cavo, thank you. Pull it out of my ear. Uh -huh. the, it's the Cavo um, Sonic Flex Sonic Scaler. And really almost any Sonic Scaler would work. I just happen to be a Cavo guy. And you can see the tip um, that's on here. We'll get a, a close up shot of it. This happens to have a very, very fine diamond on it. So oftentimes I will use this diamond. Uh, I can use it to remove the temporary cement and it goes very quickly. You could use a smooth one and just vibrate it off if you wanted to. But I don't mind using this fine diamond. I'll also use this fine diamond in this sonic scaler to smooth some of my margins if I'm right next to the tissue. And so this removes tooth very slowly and it comes in different diamond grits. This just happens to be a fine. But I can take this and pull it along the margin if I'm right next to the gingiva and I don't want to cause any bleeding. And it won't cause any bleeding because obviously it's just an ultrasonic vibration. It's not 
not a burr that's rotating that will cut the tissue. And so when I'm going and cleaning up some subgingival margins, oftentimes I will use the sonic scaler to smooth the margin so I know that I won't tear up the tissue or make it bleed. But if you are going to use Duralon as a um, temporary cement, I suggest that you use it the regular way, mix it just one-to-one -one as you usually would, and have one of these sonic scalers on hands because that only takes about 25 seconds to get the Duralon off versus an hour with a sickle scaler. That said, I know some dentists who have mixed Duralon in its regular concentration and added a little Vaseline to that to make it a little easier to get off the tooth. The challenge with it really is getting it off the tooth and not having it stick to the temporary. And it's funny because most of us, you know, moved away from Duralon as a permanent cement because crowns that were put on with Duralon seemed to fall off right around the five year mark. It was convenient because now the insurance benefits had started again in case you needed a new crown. But we always thought about Duralon as being the cement that washed out and didn't have a very good bond strength uh, to the tooth itself. Uh, it does in the beginning. So during the two weeks of the temporary, you'll find you get a much higher bond strength to dentin than you ever wanted. And it, you know, it might only be two to four megapascals, but it's enough where you're gonna need a sonic scaler to get that cement off. Nice. Otherwise, it's an unbelievably tough chore. Two letters where luckily, yeah. I guess what I have. What do you have? I have two photos. What? One of these you're saying hallelujah or singing Uptown Funk, I'm not sure. Love that song. <laughs> And this other one, I'll let you decide which one goes to which. I don't know what you're doing there. I do know what I'm doing there. Oh. This is when we had received the Huckleberry. I was trying to think of something that rhymed with it, but I couldn't. Um, the Huckleberry Fun right. package from <laughs> from Dr. Elliot. Elliot yeah. And so I was throwing up the wrapping paper as... Oh, got it. That's what that purple thing is Yes, in there. excitement. Okay. All right, got it. I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure what all the celebration. What do you mean? How could you not tell? And uh, two reverse uh, preparation burr kits. <gasps> one for each retail Whoa. value of I don't even know. But uh, and this one we're just smiling all nice. Yeah, I know. We're all happy. We'll see. Nice. We'll see who crazy. gets the more. Nice. Yeah, I think crazy. Sonia might nice. get the crazy one. Crazy. Yeah. Vermont, well, by the way, the one state in the U.S. where I've seen the Northern Lights. Oh, that's so cute on your backpacking trip with your college friend. Something like that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any news? <laughs> yes. Prosecutors say a Massachusetts woman hid in her ex-husband's minivan wearing camouflage clothing and a mask before chasing him into his dental office and attacking him with an axe. The woman got into her ex-husband's car, surprised to find their 11-year-old son in there, waiting for his dad to get off work. Police say the boy did not recognize his mom in her disguise. The woman allegedly put her son in a chokehold, but he escaped and told his father someone was in the van. When the man got to the car, the woman allegedly chased him into his office, swung the axe twice at him, but he was able to block her, block her attacks and subdue her until police arrived. Police say the woman had a machete, a novelty baseball bat, and a pair of work gloves. Police also note that the woman was a suspect in a fire that destroyed the couple's home, but no one was ever charged. She's being held without bail and faces 11 charges to which she has pled not guilty. Right? What's up? That's a, that is perhaps the weirdest story we've ever done here. Ma'am. And you know who I think is behind it? Who? Cecil the Lion. Put her up to this. This is... Revenge. What, first of all... I don't know an oral surgeon who drives a minivan, but okay, okay. We'll, I'll get by that. Well, Why listen, is this? He, they've, been, they've been separated, divorced, whatever, for 18 months, and he has custody of their four kids. Yeah, so, so that, that tells you something about her sanity. Exactly. But what's the son doing in the van waiting for dad to get out of work? Thank you. Where the window's cracked. That they sounds sh kind of illegal. Yeah. So I don't know. Why did she put the son in a chokehold? I don't know. <laughs> the, the bigger question here is, why is she wearing camo? In a car. The biggest question is, what the heck was the novelty baseball bat for? A Red Sox little <laughs> beat gift you to they death when they. Uh... You know, at like the Angels Ooh. game where they give you everyone gets like a free right, something? right, right novelty Maybe, bat night. Right. Maybe she got a novelty bat and she thought, but if you have a machete and an axe, right. That's what's what you, funny about this. What are you going to do with the bat? Right. A little mini bat. <laughs> right, just a little. From your dollhouse. Out of those three things, the only one the TSA will let you bring on an airplane is the novelty baseball bat. Because even they recognize you can do no damage with Nothing. that. I don't know. I don't know. I honestly, everything about this story is insane. And it's like, it's just clearly the woman. I feel sorry for the kid. Yeah. I, I mean, know. he's obviously spending time with his dad. Didn't recognize mom in the disguise. But hopefully, 
they won't have to right and then to be they say that he was witness obviously to the mom attacking the right. dad and she and i guess she had told the son prior to this i have to kill your father oh wow so, talk so it about, goes even deeper so how so how about some therapy yeah that's that's awful anything happier uh, kind of. Okay. A retired Ohio dentist could face 24 years in prison for using $125,000 from investors to gamble and pay off credit cards, according to the Ohio Department of Commerce. The 78-year-old man pleaded guilty to an indictment containing four counts of theft, three counts of securities fraud, and three counts of misrepresentations in the sales of securities. Prosecutors say the man lured four individuals to invest in a company that created a process pr for preserving adult stem cells harvested from developing wisdom teeth in children and young adults. But then he used the funds at casinos and to cover other personal expenses. The sentencing hearing is scheduled for the end of October. Uh. That's not happier. I'm sorry. <laughs> not, no, it I know, is I know, happy. I know. It's better than, you know. No, it is. It's better than attempted murder. But right. That he's 78 right? is kind of sad. He must be a young, chipper 78, I would think. It just makes me sad because obviously, you know, if you're doing that, then you have what seems to be a gambling addiction. Right. Um, and at 80 years old, I don't know. I mean. It's funny because most dentists go into dentistry because they say they don't want to go into sales. And then meanwhile, this guy's right. pitching this fake company to I get these three investors. The, oh, it's a real company. Yeah, which, oh, I, which I was okay. trying to understand because when I was doing research for the story, um, I was researching this company that they were talking about, and it's like a legit thing. So I'm wondering, well, at least, I mean. So he was maybe taking the money as a broker on behalf of the company and was going to invest it for them. Perhaps. And then spend it at casinos. And credit card debt, which probably came from casinos. And other personal expenses. Hmm. That, let's hope the media does not grab onto that story. No. And uh, no. file that under Cecil the Lion. We, we have these, we need some uh, dentists to go out and do some charity work. Somebody needs to save a life. A dentist needs to talk somebody off hey, a building. We have done many stories here where the dental hygienist will, you know, save a life right, because, right. you know, she had CPR skills or whatever. There's, there are dentists doing really good things out there. Well, I know, but that we need the national press to run with this story like the Cecil the Lion one. And unfortunately, you probably need the sensationalistic aspects of a dentist posing with a lion. Right. Well, let's be on the lookout. You, if you're I around will. a river next, you know, in the next couple of days, see if you can find anyone drowning you, and you save them. You fake a Jane seizure will. on the next issue of Chairside Live, and I will, um, I'll bring you, we have defibrillators here in the building. And do you be a mild shock? I'll bring you back, see if the local news will pick it up. No, well, he, here's the thing. Okay, so coming up in, uh, in, a, in a future episode, we, you might see a clinical video here on Chairside, Chairside oh, yeah. Live of yours truly. Of me working on Megan. So That's let's right. just pray right. that everything goes as planned. And if it doesn't, right. you or James better be ready to hop in and help. Okay? <laughs> I'm studying for it by watching the Chris Rock comedy DVD, Bring the Pain. Okay. That's, That's because, terrifying. That's what I'm bringing. Uh, we'll have anesthetic, don't worry. But yeah, close up into Megan's mouth, everybody. You ever want to see Megan's molars? Look for it in an upcoming episode of Chairside Live. But that about wraps this episode of Chairside Live up. On behalf of all of us here at the lab, Megan, the CSL crew, we want to thank you for your time and your continued commitment to quality dentistry. See you next time. Cheers. And you might be having a tough day at the office, but you're going to feel a little better after you hear what this oral... oral Come on, man! Oral I sturgeon went through. <laughs> She writes, what? Exclamation mark galore. Where is the tiny, the tiny? Let's try that again. <laughs> tiny, tiny. It's shiny. The tiny bald head? Oh. Shiny, not tiny. Oh, so cute on your backpacking trip with your college friend.